quick quick introduction my name is akash i am the co-founder and ceo of jovian we are an online uh, learning platform for data science and software development we have several courses you can check out we also have a uh, a couple of like longer term programs you can check out those as well i think we have a few members from our team are present here as well in case you want to talk uh, but we are really excited to welcome you to this stable diffusion or generative ai meetup and uh, i actually have to thank kartik kartik gulavat co-founder of uh, deep clarity for uh, suggesting this idea we used to do meetups back in 2018 and 2019 where uh, we were working in deep learning computer vision and we wanted to have a community where we could chat with people we could talk about some of the interesting things that are happening in the in the community then of course covid happened and all of that stopped we kept doing webinars but now we are excited to uh, kick this off and i just want to thank you all for coming because i know that we just put this up on meetup.com and you guys found it somehow so that's great and you guys decided to come here and uh, we have a bunch of interesting talks planned i will mention though like we are doing this after a long time so you might find that uh, we we're not very professional at doing these talks just yet but keep coming back we're planning to do this more often um and more than anything it is about just meeting with the community talking to each other uh learning you know sharing our excitement about what's happening in the world of ai in the world of data science and sharing our knowledge right so hopefully many of you who are sitting in the audience today will be coming back and giving us giving talks in the future as we do more of these events um so with that we will kick things off we will have four maybe five talks we've had some last minute additions which is great and we will then have like just uh, you can just chat with each other and you can just ask questions to each other meet each other so just general i don't want to call it networking as such but just general hanging out um and yeah feel free to grab some snacks uh, on the way okay so let's begin with the first talk so i will hand it over to kartik and kartik is going to talk about the different ways to run diffusion models uh thank you akash uh hi uh, so first of all uh, again we start with apologize apologizing for the first time because we are doing this after quite a while so please ignore if uh, i make any errors uh, uh, and uh, really excited to kick this off with uh, basically different ways of running diffusion models uh, so before that how many people here have uh, run stable diffusion or like who has not run i think that's is there anyone who has not executed stable diffusion okay so then yeah this might be of help uh, to uh, these folks and also for people who have run these uh, it will be good for us to uh, do a recap uh, do a contrast and then maybe after the talk we can discuss about uh, what you guys and what everyone else is uh, uh, doing in their workflow and how do how are people working on uh, speeding up their workflow basically okay yeah so how do i go get out of full screen here let's see yes okay 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 so uh, basically stable diffusion uh, is running in two different uh, modes or parallel mainstreams right now one is the ckpd version uh, and the other one is uh, the diffusers library so the diffusers library is something which is maintained by hugging face folks itself Uh, and the ckpt version is maintained by the uh, in general uh, open source community uh, so we'll get into the details and the discussions of the difference between uh, these two versions and the way to uh, run these models so um, and some of it is obviously going to be subjective because i'm just uh, sharing my experience of uh, using and running these models so the most popular uh, interface to run stable diffusion models is automatic uh, web ui uh this is the most rated uh, open source community powered uh, platform to run and generate uh, images and it supports a lot of uh, variety of features uh it is very stable uh, uh because once you install it it will keep auto updating if you want it can uh, perform a with you know different varieties of features and it has a lot of extensions which can uh, you know even compete with uh, photoshop level quality editing to some extent and the way and the speed at which people are developing extensions for this is uh, like uh, quite unprecedented and 
like it just takes sometimes less than a week for a new research paper to get implemented uh, in this repository. So what I'll do is I'll uh, quickly take two minutes to explain some of the features that are uh, present in the automatic web UI repository. So the way to run it's going to be very simple, right? You just follow installation.md uh, and it will run, right? Because the stars are 40k. So it's not like that it's a 20 star GitHub repository where we need to uh, worry about this, right? Uh, any platform issue, anything which we face, uh, go into the issues tab. Don't just look at the open issues, look at the closed issues as well. Uh, and uh, I'm sure uh, we'll find the solution to uh, get this up and running. Um, also, I would like to mention that this is a solution which works on MacBooks, Linux, uh, Windows, and Google Colab as well. Uh, so these are the four basic uh, platforms where uh, this particular web interface could be run. So apart from the simple text to image, which a generative model does, uh, there are a lot of other cool stuff which are integrated as a native feature of this web UI. So one of the interesting things that they have integrated is an instruct pix to pix model, uh, which has also been added recently in the diffusers pipeline as well. Uh, so what this model does is you take an input image and then you instruct the model to generate something else while preserving the composition of the original image. So for example, the input uh, prompt uh, that we are seeing and prompt is what we, uh, 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 the terminology that we use for the text, which we use to guide the model. So the prompt here is to make him a cyborg and then uh, you just feed it into, uh, feed an image into this and you just say, make him a cyborg or make that dog, uh, like let's say an Alsatian instead of a Labrador. Uh, so these kind of uh, instead pix to pix model features are all automatically going to be available in this uh, repository. Another uh, feature or implementation of uh, stable diffusion is outpainting. So outpainting is when you have a image and then you want to extend the sides of the image by adding something else. So this is something which is also uh, uh, supported by an interface uh, in stable diffusion, uh, automatic UI. Uh, as opposed to that, right, what we are working with, let's say if these UIs did not exist, then we would have worked probably in a Jupyter notebook and tried to uh, run with all of these things uh, through command line or through Jupyter notebooks, right? So then the way to upload an image is quite tricky. The uh, way to modify an image uh, is quite tricky, right? So these, what these tools do is they automate most of the workflow and make our uh, overall process quite a lot easier uh, to ex actually execute them uh, as quickly as we can. And it also supports loading of in number of uh, other diffusion models, not just stability AI stable diffusion, so that we can have our uh, version of whatever we want uh, uh, get up, you know, uh, up and running very quickly. Apart from out painting, another implementation for a stable diffusion is in painting. Uh, this is also uh, supported through this web UI, right? So imagine building a paint like interface within Jupyter Notebook, right? So this is something that people have already provided for us. So this dog, let's say people are painting around that dog and then saying that uh, they make this photo a clean bench, right? So then uh, the in-painting model gets to work and uh, removes whatever was uh, painted there. Then there are uh, some other features like masking. Uh, one important feature that I would like to mention is prompt matrix. So the idea for running stable diffusion model is uh, like when we are experimenting with what to generate, we need to run multiple iterations. And sometimes we are not sure on what to generate. So we, the easiest way all of us can use is a for loop, right? And we can generate images in a for loop and then show them together. They have automated that for us. So through some very simple uh, way by which we declare the prompts uh, or type in the text, uh, we can generate this kind of matrix where it could be a combination of different features uh, together or not together. And the uh, advantage here is uh, that since this runs on batch and since this runs on GPU memory, it's going to execute all of this with a more faster speed and more faster precision as compared to a native for loop and us executing this one by one. So we don't do, need to do all these optimizations while uh, running these. Uh, then the latest uh, upscaler is also included in this as a feature. Upscaler is something where uh, you generate image only at the half the resolution and then increase, uh, use that image as the base image and then uh, basically pass it into the model again to, uh, uh, to be basically get a more refined uh, form of output. If you just directly use as a text and if the text is not very accurate, uh, what happens is there are a lot of artifacts sometimes which get generated in uh, the output. Uh, and this is again one of a very powerful technique to 
uh, get around that. So I think all of it, consuming all of it together might be confusing. And to be honest, that's where I am also at. But that's the reality of it that in the past six months, every single day, something new comes up and you have to keep up with it. This repository would probably be the best way to keep up with whatever is happening. Okay, and then there, uh, there are features like attention, which could be uh, given to some specific set of words, uh, which is also uh, easily implementable uh, in the web UI because it's already integrated. So any words that we want to focus on or not focus on, we can use uh, brackets or square brackets to make sure that we can uh, change the intensity with which the model is going to perceive that word while generating something. Okay, so this is about automatic UI. Another way of running diffusion model is uh, invoke AI. Uh, this is also a quite a popular uh, interface of running these models. Uh, it's also frequently updated. Uh, one of the features uh, this particular model has is a unified canvas feature, which is a alteration of in painting fe out painting feature. So in out painting, what we do is we take an image and we say that okay, give us the sides of the images which are generated, right? But what unified canvas does is it's like sort of a, like an in, infinite canvas. So on an infinite canvas, you can uh, select pieces of it and dynamically uh, generate entire areas out of it. So it's more like uh, if you're familiar with Figma or any other uh, infinite canvas based design tools, it's, it has a more of a, that kind of an experience. So this is one of the unique experiences which Invoke AI tool provides, which is not going to be available uh, in automatic UI. So let's say if you are experimenting or if you are trying to blend multiple images together, so then this Invoke AI tool uh, becomes a very powerful uh, tool to run things. Uh, unfortunately, right now it's not working nicely on Colab. I might be wrong, but I was not able to get it running on Colab. Uh, but yeah, people keep working on it and things keep breaking. So uh, I'm not sure about that. But on a local machine or any other machine, this would be uh, uh, an easy way to go. Okay, so on MacBooks, if we don't want to get into a web interface and we want to uh, have something native and have something which we can extend natively, uh, this is a very good starting point, an app called Diffusion B. So it's also available on GitHub. Uh, and uh, it also does some of the basic things that the automatic or Invoke AI does. It's not as advanced as that, but it gives you a native interface. And it's uh, because it's native, it's more controllable and slightly less clunky than as compared to a web-based uh, interface. Okay. Uh, next thing here is how to run this on iPad and iPhone. So this is quite an interesting area and a lot of people are experimenting towards it. Uh, so this is one of the experimentation. Uh, this is an app called draw things. This came out in November and what this does is it allows stable diffusion to run on iPad on a local machine. So without, uh, hosting for any cloud services, this model is able to run and generate images on the iPad or Apple phone itself. So right now it has only been possible on iPad and Apple phone. Android is slightly lagging behind, but only a past couple of days back, Qualcomm has done a very uh, interesting experiment around uh, running stable diffusion, and they claim to have faster speeds than the core ML counterpart itself. So that might be coming soon. So this probably, let's say in the future, this goes down from 30, 40 seconds to let's say, you know, sub 10 second outputs. Um, like it will be a game changer, especially for someone who wants to design as an artist, because these tools provide an interface, which mouse basically cannot provide, which is uh, to use the screen as a sketch pad. And that's the, one of the most powerful uh, interfaces, uh, which we can experiment with a lot of things in stable diffusion. So for in painting, uh, for example, you want to draw over things, drawing over mouse with uh, is going to take time, but if the interface is over paired over with the sketch pad, uh, it's, it's going to be a much more powerful and a much more intuitive interface, which, uh, not just developers, but anyone else, uh, will also be able to understand and use very smoothly. Uh, and this, yeah, the, a little bit of cautions here is that it's just a proof of concepts, uh, sort of an application. So anyone can actually go and download this and run them, uh, run this right away on their iPads. Uh, like for me, this was very amazing to see that, you know, what sounds like, you know, what automatically looks like magic is, is nowadays running just on, you know, your fingertips, 
And that's a very powerful feeling to have when you get an uh, output from these kind of models. And that's where I think uh, everyone is going to head. So this was in November. In December, Hugging Face uh, team uh, did a lot of optimizations on Core ML and they enhanced uh, support for M1 and M2 machines. So anyone who is having any M1 and M2 machine can leverage that and uh, get under 20 second output from stable diffusion on their own machine. And then Apple has also uh, optimized their core ML implementation around stable diffusion because I think their team is also uh, very interested in seeing how this uh, tech is going to evolve, especially on the edge devices. So uh, what I'll do is at the end of the uh, talk, I'll share all these uh, uh, links with you guys. Uh, so if you guys want to read more and maybe we can uh, join a, a common group together where we can discuss more about these things. Uh, but yeah, these are the links to uh, the changes that have happened in uh, core ML platform. Uh, another way of running, but not recommended way of running stable diffusion is also on Kaggle. Uh, if people are familiar with Kaggle, it's a competition platform, which provides a certain number of free hours of quota to participate in the competitions. Uh, but that same uh, compute can be used uh, just like Google Colab uh, to run stable diffusion as well. Uh, there are a lot of limitations there. What are pros and cons versus Kaggle and Colab because they are from Google, right? So, right. So Kaggle is a different company. So Colab is a different offering by Alphabet. Uh, so Kaggle is mostly competition oriented. So the way uh, their interfacing works is more tightly integrated with the data set, the competition that they are hosting. Uh, versus Colab is a more generic kind of thing where you can attach your own Google Drive, for example, right? So let's say if I have trained a personal model that I don't want to share it with anyone. So on Kaggle platform, I first need to upload that model and then use it. But in Colab, I can uh, mount my Google Drive and then use it in memory. In terms of infra, are they similar or the GPU together? It's, it's almost similar, but uh, Colab has paid tiers. Kaggle provides more powerful GPUs, uh, pre quota in general. And Kaggle also provide TPU quotas as well. Uh, but yeah, for diffusion, we don't need TPUs, but uh, that's probably one of the differences. So this is just for mentioning that, okay, that let's say if you are running out of computer, if you're just beginning to try things out and you don't want to, um, you know, invest in a heavy machine or if you, you're just looking for a uh, exploration way of uh, trying these models out, then this is a good solution. But if you uh, are getting serious about it, then you will start facing bottlenecks in this workflow and uh, you'll have to move to a more stable workflow like automatic UI or any other custom UI which you might build for yourself. Okay. Um, so these two tools are uh, links are again for Colab. Uh, so these are just point and click repositories which are again very popular. Uh, so uh, through these repositories, the automatic UI that I talked about uh, can directly be uh, using Google Colab uh, by a single click and launch in Colab. Uh, the first one is a repository which combines a technique called Dream Booth uh, and then runs it in automatic UI in Colab. So what you can do is you can upload five photos of yourself so that now the model understands who you are and then it automatically loads the UI uh, so that now you can say, okay, a photo of me doing this in the beach, right? So and it will uh, generate uh, that for you seamlessly. So that's another very great way of uh, trying things out. And especially if you are uh, yeah, not having compute access, this is a good way to try things out on Colab. Okay, how to find different uh, open source models uh, in stable diffusion. So like stable diffusion started with stability AI open sourcing the model, but after that, a lot of people have been uh, uploading their own variation and uploading their own models. Uh, like people are getting into the categories of styles, animes, realistic photos, a lot of different areas uh, people are working on. Um, and finding the right model for uh, your need is actually very critical because then you don't have to get to the uh, pains of training that model for yourself, right? which is going to be uh, coming up with a very huge cost. So a lot of people have open sourced a lot of model. And uh, I would say that in the same order, Hugging Face, Replicate and Civet AI uh, is where, sorry, uh, is where uh, these models are going to lie. Civet AI slightly can be uh, not safe for work kind of environment because it's you know, less controlled uh, in that arbitrage. Uh, but Hugging Face uh, is where you can mostly find secure models and it also, the diffuser library gives you a warning when you are trying to run something with a not safe for work content. Uh, so that's the main difference. But Civet AI also has, because it has a strong community support, the quality of models that they have uh, is quite realistic. So I'll just open this link and just uh, show you for reference if uh, you guys have not visited this website. 
So these are some of the models which are uh, open source and which could be uh, uh, used in the pipeline. So the difference between this and the standard stable diffusion model, which is uh, what Akash is going to talk about a lot as well in his talk, is that uh, every model is uh, sort of fine-tuned on a certain specific flavor. So for example, the last one looks like more like a game generated scene. This one looks like uh, more like a realistic uh, sort of a setting. And then this, there are some models which um, uh, are most trained on anime kind of uh, trials. So like this is a very good website to explore and see uh, what is trending. And all of these can directly be loaded in the automatic web UI uh, just by a single click because community has already actively provided an extension through which you can do that without having to spend a lot of time trying to configure things together. So these are the three uh, main uh, sources of uh, finding good models for almost whatever we can need. So what we need basically is a good model, then we need a good prompt, and then we need a good complete. So the third one, unfortunately, there is no solution, but the first two are pretty much available if you are just willing to look for it. Okay. So here are some of the jargons I have added here. Uh, so I would uh, probably uh, also ask uh, uh, people in the audience right now to add more to it if they can think of anything that you know they think is a term which only came in the past six, seven months. Uh, LoRa, Clip, high risk fix, textural inversion, out painting, safe tensors, something I didn't knew about. You know, this problem even existed, but it's a very interesting and a very uh, highly security concerning problem. Uh, and yeah, the latest addition to this is control net. How many of you guys have heard about control net? Okay, so this is the next game changer which is coming after stable diffusion, and the early experiments are very, very promising. And everyone on Twitter and Reddit are going very crazy about it. It launched 15, 20 days ago. It's an extension on top of stable diffusion, which allows you to uh, mimic any pose or uh, take any depth and then generate the output model with almost the same composition as the input image. Uh, so it's a very powerful uh, extension to stable diffusion, which is uh, which has come in. Um, but yeah, if you guys are unfamiliar with all of these, that is also okay. And that is the concept that these fancy names will keep on popping up and everything will be getting replaced because there is so much of space that this page can hold. So if anything new comes in, something older will go away. That's the way uh, this field is going to progress. And that's uh, basically the representation that I wanted to keep here. So don't worry if you don't understand about all of these jargons, but what you can do is uh, in your own time, this all of these keywords provide a good head start. And there is a lot of depth into each of these single uh, words. So you guys can spend a little bit of time uh, on your own and uh, read more about it. So anyone uh, think that I have missed something? Any Anything new? Anything else? Yeah. Any, yeah. In the domain of stable diffusion. Okay, great. So that means, yeah, <laughs> I, I covered pretty much 80% of it, I would say. <laughs> Okay, so this is the last thing, how not to have FOMO. So how many of you guys are having FOMO since the past couple of months and how many of you guys are feeling sometimes depressed in the past couple of months? <laughs> so yeah, that's the case with me. Uh, three main resources. First is Twitter and Reddit to find out anything which is happening in the latest trend. Uh, you just sleep and wake up and you find something new and something exciting. And you also find a lot of people helping out with, you know, sub, uh, sort of, I would say these tweet storms have converted into sort of micro blogs. So what we used to do in medium past couple of years back, people are doing directly in Twitter these days, especially the AI ML community. So if you guys are not on Twitter, uh, get on Twitter. If you guys are okay with a little bit of not safe for work content, uh, get on Reddit stable diffusion as well. Uh, and, uh, but uh, that's where uh, the highest, uh, energy is uh, in the domain you'll find on Reddit Stable Diffusion. It's it's a very powerful resource and uh, the community is also very good there. Um, and the last thing is that this Twitter account uh, just added because it recently became a meme uh, because this person uh, uh, finds and shares the research papers uh, which are trending with so much of speed that uh, like some people you know have difficulty believing that he is a human. Uh, so it's a very good uh, Twitter profile to follow and like one of the best out there. Uh, so if you want to get updated on any one of uh, uh, the latest trends, not just in stable diffusion, but in general AI and ML, uh, these would be uh, some of the good resources. 
Okay, so this is the last slide. Uh, some of the learning aids that I have shared, uh, how to get started in depth about stable diffusion. So, so far what you have discussed about is from a user endpoint in terms of how we interface, how we uh, deal with the interface, how we use it as an API. But if you want to get into a little bit of depth into stable diffusion, these are the three links that I'm, uh, I would like to share uh, that help me learn. So one is the diffusion model class, which is taken by uh, Lewis from Hugging Face uh, itself. Uh, it's a very good class and with very good explanations by Jonathan uh, Wittager and Lewis. Other one is uh, fast AI. Uh, so some of us here are already biased towards fast AI and we are huge fast AI fans. Uh, and we also took this uh, course, which is going to come public in the next couple of months. And the two first two part videos of this course are already available online for everyone to look at. So if anyone has not looked at those videos, that would be a very good starting point to learn about uh, the generative technique and bridging the gap between uh, conventional neural network to an understanding of how diffusion models work and what is the base magic behind uh, this feeling that you get by looking at the output. And the last one is from Andre Karpathy, uh, not re probably relevant to stable diffusion, but it's quite close to where the entire things are heading. Uh, master of backprop, obviously, and uh, also uh, the latest lecture on how to build a nano GPT in a two hour video. It's like one of the craziest uh, videos that you can probably find on the internet. Okay, so yeah, I would like to conclude the talk. Thank you for your time and attention. And uh, well, let's uh, discuss after the uh, uh, all the sessions are over. And I would like to have uh, feedback on uh, what your thoughts on these things are. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot uh, again, Karthik, for the various ways. I was not aware that I can actually just go and click run on a couple of these platforms. Okay. Next up, we have. Uh, yeah, next up we have Mohammad Arslan. So I will hand it over to you, Arslan, and you can pick up from here. Yeah, you can just use this present. You can use left, right. Okay. Uh, no, okay. Yeah, no okay. So hi guys, this is me, Muhammad Asla. Uh, so I work as a tech lead in the CTO office in Capgemini. So uh, past uh, two years or uh, three years, I'm completely into ML and uh, especially past two years, uh, our company got uh, special access to GPT-3 model uh, much before the public launch. We got beta access. Uh, since then, I'm uh, working in uh, NLP, Generative AI. Uh, and uh, when uh, last year's stable diffusion, uh, Weights were released. I am uh, completely focusing on the genetic way. And I share uh, and I share multiple uh, uh, readings and uh, walk around uh, genetic way in the LinkedIn uh, with a good uh, community of 10,000 followers. And uh, recently I won Stable Diffusion Hackathon, OHA Hackathon, and Open EA Hackathon, and a uh, uh, Blogathon by Machine Hack. So uh, today, since today uh, uh, we are focusing on uh, stable diffusion and uh, generative uh, AI, I like to focus on my work which I built for uh, Go here. Go here again is a language model. Uh, it's a competitor for uh, 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 GPT-3 from OpenAI. And this is about me. Yeah. So as part of Hackathon, I was I I built a entire designing tool. Uh, this tool also got accepted for Microsoft Founders Hub. Uh, this tool is a combination of uh, multiple uh, models like uh, GPT-3 and uh, uh, stable diffusion and uh, multiple hacks, uh, prompt engineering and uh, stable diffusion hacks. Uh, what this tool basically does is like uh, it uh, it uh, democratizes the entire designing uh, industry. Like we, since we know that uh, uh, interior uh, designing is a very expensive, uh, like especially if you go for in America, it is a very costly. They charge you very uh, a, a good good amount uh, in doing consulting in terms of uh, in terms of uh, doing data designing consulting. Uh, so my work. Uh, uh, so using this tool, people can easily uh, leverage the power of uh, uh, multiple uh, language models like uh, GPT-3 and Stable Diffusion. 
uh, to do uh, interior designing of a uh, home. And uh, one of the key USP here is like uh, it, uh, we can uh, do it for free. I'll tell you. Yeah, so the tools I use is Cohere language model, GPT-3, uh, hugging face spaces and uh, ESR GAN. ESR GAN for again for uh, upscaling of the uh, uh, images and Google Collab for GPU. And uh, I use Dream Boot and Stable Diffusion for like uh, fine tuning the Stable Diffusion, diffusion 1.5 model. So here's a solution wherein if you upload the image uh, and uh, let's say I have an old uh, uh, or like say um, unorganized uh, place and I want to uh, redesign, I'll just uh, upload the image and I'll, I'll give uh, which uh, which uh, which uh, type of uh, design I want to do. Like I want to go with the uh, Christmas theme, I uh, say vintage theme, American, French, anything. So you just want to give the design and it will redesign it. Or if you, see, if you see here, if you want to redesign the room using uh, uh, just a generic living, uh, so it, it redesigned uh, the image and then um, like say if you have the initial image and if you upload it and if you want to say uh, decorate it for like Christmas, uh, this is your first image. Like if you want to decorate more, so, uh, you have the second image and if you want to do it better, this is a third image. And uh, and also like uh, work on to create a video out of it. Like say this is the video. Uh, it shows the transition of the uh, initial image to the final image and see how uh, our uh, um, how our uh, the room is getting transformed from uh, A to B, and we can see and at any given point, uh, we can stop at any time frame, and we can choose any particular artifact which you want to redesign. And uh, running a model like this will, uh, uh, you know, burn uh, uh, GPUs like anything. Uh, but this is just like experimental, uh, experimental uh, uh, process, and even if like they say uh, people want to pay, uh, they can go for this one. And they can see that how this uh, initial house is being uh, redesigned as a uh, Arabic style house. You can see the curtains are coming here, and uh, chandelier is redesigning, and the, even the architecture. We can sense that it's a, a Middle Eastern thing. And I'll tell you at the later part what does it do. Or it's one of the another. Let's say if you have an empty hall, and uh, if you want to redesign, uh, it's uh, redesigning into a uh, French style uh, uh, villa. So it basically able to capture the dimension. Uh, since uh, I did this two year, two months back, uh, so it's uh, uh, it's uh, failing somewhere in point in getting capturing dimension. But overall, it's capturing seventy to eighty percent of dimension of our room. And we can see that how our initial uh, room uh, just redesigned into you know, final. Yeah. So yeah, what's our like differentiator here is like uh, this solution will be for, for free. Like anyone can come and redesign the space. Like say, uh, it's for it's a, it's a free for one, and it will be freemium service. Like if I get to launch, and like say, how we may get on the montage for this is like let's say, uh, if I upload the image and uh, like, uh, and if I uh, select any particular uh, particular uh, artifact which got generated after designing. So you will get a reference links from Amazon, from Alibaba, or Flipkart. Uh, so I'll be uh, so from here, uh, people can buy it and uh, get the credits for future use. Yeah, that's it. And uh, and recently, one stable diffusion hackathon and uh, uh, machine hack and my uh, webinar on Chat GPT in Delhi. It is a one hour session uh, in analytics with yeah, uh, and it is one of the highest rated. Uh, uh, webinar even compared to uh, machine learning engineers from hugging face so since uh, we don't have time for one hour so i'll just uh, uh so you if you can if you people can search uh, on youtube we'll get the link yeah this uh this is one of the hackathon which i won uh, uh from korea and uh, my fellow participant amir is here yeah yeah, that's it and uh and see uh and business plan is like uh not business plan like uh I just want to talk in terms of technology. Uh, so like uh, nowadays, I need not to learn anything uh, mathematics behind the model or anything. Anyone can build anything. They just need to have a idea uh, and they can just make the API call to GPT-3 without knowing that what's happening in the backend. And they can, even a normal uh, high school uh, people uh, in American school, school kids are building uh, build, uh, building uh, solutions and and they are printing the money, little they're printing the money. High school students in America. And uh, 
if you have a vision to design something, build a, any AI based app, you can build at a very short time. You just need to make API calls. Uh, you, you will get your work done. And I think uh, like similar work can be done in using the automobile industry, automobile redesigning, uh, apparel. Apparel is a huge market. Like we have a means of Flipkart. Uh, so apparel industry is so uh, recently there's one more, uh, there's a one more development happened. You, I think you mentioned picks to picks. Yeah, fix to fix, uh, and also control it. Control it is also a very powerful uh, 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 algorithm which uh, which released two 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 weeks back, and it, it, it is a huge hit. So I think utilizing this uh, integrate uh, not only integrate designing uh, any designing industry is going to get get disrupted. And uh, talking about the language models, uh, this is one of the like uh, funny uh, comparison I had <laughs> to see how this uh, can be you know like compared with the uh, robot uh, Gajni or uh, Inception. First is like Gajni. Uh, Gajni is also smart, but it can remember, remember, remember for only 15 minutes. <laughs> you, you need to keep, uh, uh, you know, uh, notes and everything. So similar to ChatGPT also has a context window of uh, 4,000 words. Like uh, beyond 4,000 words, it, it will forget. Okay. Many people know, uh, does not avoid. But if you want to, uh, if you want to make it a, uh, yeah, uh, remember you need to uh, go with uh, my friend uh, Ravi's library GPT index. Using that, uh, you can integrate. Uh, uh, you can integrate document, uh, document or any uh, external file uh, with the uh, chat GPT. And also, like a uh, and logo, uh, uh, it can be you know like uh, used by malicious actors to do multiple kind of like. Uh, we have seen many uh, multiple jailbreaks in Twitter and. Uh, uh, like we have seen that many any technology may come, uh, it will have positive effect and non positive effect as well. And uh, like similar to Gajni and uh, cutoff data is limited. And uh, for regarding inception, it's like, uh, like say nowadays everyone are uh, using uh, generative models uh, to create a uh, blogging, right? Blog, right? Uh, writing, uh, Twitter, uh, writing. Imagine. Uh, after five years, uh, somebody wants to train the uh, somebody wants to train their own model. So they can't train the model based on the uh, train output of a previous model. That would be disastrous. It's similar to GP uh, like inception. You can't go into multiple trains. Like uh, it will be like you'll be stuck in limbo. Yeah, this one of the uh, uh, another interesting open source work, work I did for hugging face. Uh, it is called meme word. Uh, if you upload any image, like a funny image, like a yo, any any, any image, it can be a random image as well. If you have upload any image and upload the selected department, uh, that will uh, that will uh, tell you the relevant meme, non-offensive meme. Okay. And uh, this is one of the solution if we built for police or Karnataka state police, but it didn't get materialized. But uh, uh, it is very interesting work we did. Uh, this one is to like say uh, uh, creating a description of a missing person, and also like uh, we have a sketch to image concept. Like uh, like police, what they will do? Uh, generally, they will have a professional artist. Uh, they will uh, they will draw the you know uh, sketch of a missing person. So this, using this tool, people police can uh, any you know like agency can upload the uh, just a drawing of a missing person that will have a the the model will out, output a colorful photo. And also, uh, we integrate this with the uh, image search engine. Like uh, we can connect with uh, some dummy database, and it, it will search where uh, uh, whose face is maximum uh, like uh, like uh, ma matching with. And last one is like uh, um, like also we can connect with the uh, CCTVs, uh, live live uh, CCTV camera. Like say, if any missing person's sketch is uploaded, that that image that the sketch will get converted to image, and that will get. Uh, are tagged to uh, that uh, database. And uh, one more feature of uh, what we are building is uh, uh, Google search engine. Like that image again goes for Google search and it will show uh, uh, where is that person at the moment. Uh, maybe like uh, we can get information from Twitter and LinkedIn anyway. Uh, one more feature is like a uh, knowledge graph. I uh, hope uh, some of you are aware of. So we can create a knowledge graph as well. Uh, like saying that uh, if you upload uh, uh, information about a particular uh, uh, person from LinkedIn, Twitter, anyway, it uh, it will automatically it will automatically will create a knowledge graph. So if you have seen in police station, they'll be having a, a board with uh, you know multiple connectors. 
Oh, similarly, we so unfortunately because the competition was very uh, uh, cutthroat uh, competition, we didn't uh, uh, it, I, it, we didn't got even short shortlisted, but we are working on it for other hackathons. And this is one of our uh, one more solution uh, like stable diffusion. Stable diffusion uh, to generate the uh, paintings. Yeah, that's about my work. Uh, uh, I combined multiple stable diffusion with GPT three and other language models to build and uh, and I in um uh, uh hackathons and also contributing to the open source. Uh, uh in hugging face, I am actively uh, active in uh, hugging face, contributing to the hugging face uh, page spaces, and also sharing my uh, work across uh, LinkedIn. So if you people want to connect with me, or uh, these are my uh, Thank you. Thanks, Mohammed. Um, I think the video that showed the, the empty living room becoming like a French villa that was really interesting. We'll try and share the slides. Is it yeah. is that okay? We'll share the slides after the event. Okay. Next, I would like to invite Deepak. So Deepak is also one of the founders of Deep Clarity in Karthik's uh, partners. So yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, if I'm not audible, let me know at the back. Fine. Okay, fine. So, uh, as Karthi covered uh, uh, various ways you can run diffusion models uh, in the web interface on your machines. This one? Yeah. I'll just full screen it. Can you full screen? Now it's visible. Anyway, we'll open links and we'll follow through the link. So as uh, Karthik covered how to run diffusion models uh, on web interfaces on your machines, right? Uh, one of the like most important aspect of uh, uh, getting good images out of diffusion models is called a prompt, prompt engineering. So what is a prompt? Prompt is a text that you give to the model to generate uh, any image, right? So let's say you can say uh, a dog uh, on a beach or a dog uh, eating ice cream, whatever, right? And the diffusion model will give you that particular image, right? But getting a good image is not a, that simple that just writing a dog on a beach. Uh, usually if you just use very uh, simple uh, words, you will not get that uh, great results from uh, diffusion models, right? Uh, so what we need to do is that, uh, uh, there's a new field evolving called prompt engineering. Uh, it covers how you should uh, structure your prompt. What are the aspects? What are the keywords or categories uh, you can add to your prompt to get the desired results, right? Uh, and this is not a definitive list that this is the way you get it, right? But it's an overview of a framework. You can play with it and then um, you can see what type of results you're getting, right? So basically we'll cover these uh, nine uh, categories. Uh, with First is subject, like uh, in a prompt, the most important category is the subject that you want to get, right? A dog, a cat, a human. So what exactly you want to focus on, that's your subject. Right? And you have to mention that uh, uh, in your prompt. Uh, your subject can be a sort of a noun, like a dog or a man or a woman. And uh, you can also mention specific uh, uh, names, and if uh, some, uh, if the like a stable diffusion model, they will understand those names also. You can say, I want Elon Musk's photo. So he, the model can generate Elon Musk's photo because they understand those popular uh, human beings, right? Uh, second, uh, what I will do is I'll go over, I will open one link and we'll go over uh, uh, certain examples how to structure your prompts, okay? From this site, we'll just uh, take examples that if you give just raw prompt to the a model, saying a dog, a knight on a horse, or a hamburger, right? Most probably you'll get some bad image, which which is not that useful for you. They are not centered. The head is cut, and uh, in the burger, the burger is not very realistic, right? And uh, how do we enhance these pictures? And how we do? How do we get the type of photo that we want? Realistic photos, right? So we'll open another link and we'll go over an example where we'll take a subject 
and we'll add uh, various categories to that subject and we'll see how these categories affect the output. And you will see uh, through those. Uh, we wanted to run live demos, but the generation takes 10, 15 minutes for each. So it, it would be a long uh, uh, talk. First category, uh, as I mentioned, is subject. Subject is what you want to see in the image, right? Any noun, uh, animal, anything, right? So we'll start with the example where we have Emma Watson and uh, she's a wizard or a sorceress. And we have a basic from Emma Watson as a powerful, mysterious sorceress casting lightning magic detailed truth, right? So this is a basic prompt that we enter in any, in any diffusion model. And it will most probably give you this type of output. Now, how do you enhance it or how do you get a different styles, right? So next, next category is a medium, right? A medium is that what material was used to make an artwork. So you can take real life examples that sometimes you have oil paintings, sometimes you have uh, 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 3D renderings, illustrations, and you can add those uh, keywords to your prompt and then the image will change to that type of uh, uh, medium. So here we have added just digital painting uh, to the prompt. And after adding that, we are getting uh, images in the form of digital painting. Uh, next category uh, that you can add to your prompt is a style. A style is the artistic style. Like, is it hyper-realistic? It's surreal, it's pop art, right? And you add that and you uh, the image will change in that style. So in the same prompt, if we add uh, these uh, not in, these styles, the image has changed to uh, a different style. Next, we can also enhance our images by adding the name of the artist in the prompt. So a famous artist name can be added to the prompt and the model understands their style and uh, it will generate the image in the artist's style. And you can also blend the artists, like you can enter two names or three names and you get a mixture of uh, those styles. So like these are famous artists and uh, just we added Arjun Lau and Alfonso Mukha and uh, we are getting different type of images. Same prompt, we are just adding few new keywords and we are getting different type of results. You can also add famous website which host like uh, art or images. And if you say that it's trending on art station, the uh, diffusion model understands that I have to make a better image because uh, only a good image will trend there, right? So it understands that. So if you add art station or Devan art in your prompt, uh, usually the image is enhanced and you get better images. Right? Now resolution is one more thing you can add to your prompt. You can add highly detailed, sharp, sharp focus and by adding that your uh, uh, images are most get enhanced better get more details in the image and there are other keywords so it's an open field there is no like uh, rules to that right you can add uh, that i want uh, uh, you can add the uh, emotions right i want happy sad you can add some feelings like depressed gloomy any keywords like that, and you will get those type of images. The model will try to give those type of images, right? And you can write sunny day, you can write climate, you can write weather conditions. So uh, adding these keywords and combinations, your uh, prompt uh, enhances and you get better images. Of that. Same thing like these are colors. Uh, here we added that we want an iridescent gold color and the image will change to that, that type of color. You are seeing that we are getting the color. And lighting is also a keyword. You can write based on say, cinematic lighting, or dark lighting, and uh, the images will be generated in those type of lightings. Still, you can see it's Emma Watson only, but just uh, adding and removing keywords and we're getting different images and you can also remove keywords. So you have to play with the combinations of what you are, uh, you have to iterate uh, when you're generating this. One more, just uh, last thing I'll cover is the negative prop. So as we give a prompt to the model, there is a concept of a negative prompt of words that we don't want the model to focus on. 
So if you're generating a human, or let's say you're generating an animal uh, image, you can write human as a negative prompt, man as a negative prompt. The model knows that I don't have to focus on these. And usually you get better results. Sometimes what you will see that with the same, some prompt, you're not getting very good results. The hands are not drawn correctly, or the face is not good. Then you can write a negative prompt that TFA, uh, like, uh, like uh, fingers, uh, bad fingers, resolution, low resolution, these type of negative uh, words you can write there and you'll get good prompts. Mm -hmm. Question. Yeah, same thing. So overall, that that's the uh, that's the like the uh, structure of uh, prompting, and uh, we'll share a few links. You have to go over it. And prompt engineering is something you have to uh, keep doing it, iterate over it, and then you can master it. So initially, when you start, you won't get good results. And that three links in the slide we'll share with you. You can go over them in detail. They will explain how we can structure our prompts to get good results. Uh, so yeah, doing that, you'll get uh, those results. And uh, like Karthik said, uh, try to uh, be active on uh, Reddit and Twitter. In twi on Twitter, you can search for stable diffusion on generative art. People are sharing what they're generating and they also give the prompt. So you will have reference of how to generate something. Yeah, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Great, so now you've learned uh... How stable diffusion, how you can run stable diffusion, how you should build prompts. You've looked at examples. Um, next, we have a talk by Amir. Uh, just give me a second. I'm going to open up his presentation. So next, we have a talk by oops. Next, we have a talk by Amit on a particular use case, which is how to generate your own fantasy profile pictures using stable diffusion. So, Amit, I'll hand it over to you. Sure. Do you need slideshow? Yeah. Sure. Screen this area. Sure. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry, I'm a little under the weather, so not be able to you know, <clears throat> talk about loudly as well as occasional clearing the throat. Uh, yeah, uh, a, a little bit about me. Um, uh, I have been in the IT industry for about 16 years now. I played various roles. I just like uh, to you know explore tech. Um, I was heading uh, mobile engineering at Gojek, which is like a super app of Indonesia. I did a lot of data engineering as well as systems engineering and a lot of other things over there. Um, uh, this is my second uh, stint in entrepreneurship. Uh, the first uh, one, I ran out, ran out of money and then looked for a high paying job so that I can have the financial cushion to, to the second stint. Um, I'll talk about my product um, as well as, uh, as I already mentioned, I'm already always excited about technology and uh, deep learning is something I was tracking for quite some time. Um, uh, earlier, I was doing a lot of things on NLP, uh, and uh, and that's how I met uh, <clears throat> Karthik as well. We did uh, a hackathon together where we basically explored stable diffusion. I think it was the first time for both of us, and out of it, uh, some good has come out. Um, so yeah, so what we did as part of the hackathon is is uh, train a stable diffusion model for the the world of uh, I forgot the uh, yeah. Uh, what's the what's the whole thing called? Dilbert. Dilbert. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I am. Mean, say. So yeah, uh, we trained the model uh, for uh, the world of Dilbert. You could generate different comic uh, frames using it, and then um, append some sort of uh, dialogues on it. So um, practically, you can actually generate a comic strip of your own, um, and that was basically the idea. It was uh, appreciated quite a lot. I, I think uh, the main part was uh, it was our own curiosity that we wanted to like, figure out what this uh, the whole text to image AI is and uh, things we wanted to basically explore it. Um, so this was sometime in November end, uh, mid of November or early November, I think. So uh, post that, what I did was I uh, I was also tracking a couple of people uh, who are like uh, my uh, ideals on Twitter. One of them is Level Sire. He basically launched a sort of a avatar AI, which is basically a fantasy profile pic generator. Um, as part of the hackathon, I understood you know, how stable diffusion works. I can also do it. So that's what I did. Uh, the the backend of ML and other things took 
say about a week uh, because I have already explored it. But the front end, which is basically not my forte, actually took uh, say about four weeks. So the website is called Udazzle, Y O U D A Z Z L dot com. And uh, there is a special discount code VLR50 if you want to go and generate your own profile pics. Uh, so give it a try. Uh, <clears throat> so that gave me a lot of uh, practical understanding of how to basically develop a product uh, using this particular technology. Uh, and I'm actually also uh, coming up with new ideas using the same technology, launching the products and see actually what works. Also what I'm doing as uh, later in the month is, is I'm also basically um, having a workshop on hands-on workshop on stable diffusion. So if you are very interested in uh, stable diffusion, if you want to basically explore it either as a techie or as an entrepreneur, you want to basically uh, uh, understand how things work and you want to launch your own products and see. Uh, so the, probably this is the ideal opportunity for you. What we are going to cover and thankfully like for all the previous presenters before me, they basically made my task very easy because uh, those were the things that are basically very critical for understanding stable diffusion or if you want to basically use stable diffusion for any of your products. You use the automatic 11 web UI using Polar. Other things we'll learn about prompt engineering, negative prompts, a lot of other hyperparameters that are there, steps, iterations, uh, optimizers, um, uh, all the other main things that you can do as part of stable diffusion, text to imaging, image to imaging, printing, or printing. Like, uh, say, about a month back, uh, uh, you would have chosen Dreamboot, which is what I am also using, but now Laura is the new thing. As well as for image generation, it's not so much about uh, prompt engineering now. You can actually do it with control net much better. <clears throat> so we are going to basically look at what these uh, terms are in depth, hands on, uh, using the, the web UI. Also, it's not just about using the web UI, but also understanding if you want to develop products on it. How do you go about basically doing the Python code around it? Text for text to image, image to image, and then uh, doing iterations to come up with the right prompt for it. Uh, uh, because we launch the product, also understand how do you do the a bit of ML ops around Dockerizing deployment, especially replicate, which makes it very easy to basically you know have your uh, uh, both the model training as well as the inference very easy out of the box. Uh, also understand a little bit about cost and unit economics. What are the different types of GPU? Which GPU you need for model training? Which GPU you can use for uh, inferencing? How does the cost basically come into picture? How can you basically do the products? So this is a part of Hasgeek. So if you want more info on it, uh, info at hasgeek.com, or you can reach out uh, to me on either on Twitter or via email. So that's the pitch. Uh, you can check out the <coughs> website as well, or connect to them directly. That's pretty much it. I can actually answer you about my experience uh, developing Udazzle or anything, uh, or probably after the talk, if you have any questions about the workshops. So for the common stuff, right? uh, can you generate even like uh, a storyline or is it just the events? Very interesting. So we basically, what we did is, is we basically divided the comics into frames. So. Uh, this particular comic strip that you're looking here is, is uh, actually it's a four frame, but it's basically squeezed down to three frames. So you basically have a four frames in a comic strip. And for each of the frame, you have two inputs. What is the setting? What is the character doing? Is the character walking in the park? Is the character sitting on the table? Is the character doing this, that? You can have the setting. The second is whatever the character is saying, right? So if you have any text, then what we do is we don't try to generate uh, dialogues using stable diffusion because it's really bad at it. So once the setting is generated, we basically identify using uh, <clears throat> the image CV where the character is, try to basically place uh, the dialogues on top of it, do arrow pointing so that it feels like, you know, this is, uh, but Karthik was the main engineer <laughs> doing all the all the things around it. So if you are, if you want to know more. So each image is a separate stable. Uh -huh. Yes, yes. So these are the four inferences, and then we stitch it together to make a feel of a uh, comic strip. It's not uh, in a single inference. So a storyline would be a, a bunch of each frame individual storylines. Yes. Okay.
All these are generated images. All these are generated images, but uh, the thing is, is uh, it's not the vanilla stable diffusion model. What you do is, is uh, uh, like a lot of learning around it. So what we did was we basically scraped the Dilbert website. Uh, we basically identified frames in which the particular character was the only one. Then what we did is, is uh, basically again did the image CV where we isolate the characters and then use those to train the model to make the stable diffusion understand this is Delbert, this is Dogbert, this is uh, Pointy Boss. So that uh, we were able to actually train three to four characters. Generally, train boots, you are able to train one character, but we were able to train multiple characters. And in some of the frames, we were able to put both the characters because it's also probabilistic. It is very difficult to, you know, just have it click. But, uh, and actually what you're seeing is, is, a, is a lot of filtered results, like a lot of attempts that, which were, didn't stick. Uh, not shown here. Obviously, this is the the best of the output that we. Uh, so, uh, did we fine tune the model over the previous models? Like yes, yes, right? yes. We fine tune the model over the previous models. Uh, I think uh, if you explore more, you can actually train the full model with the uh, two to three, three to four characters in a single shot. So basically, you you can give the whole input in uh, one shot, and it basically trains yeah, the whole thing. Uh, maybe it will take a No, no, actually, it's few hours. Fine, 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 fine. Oh, no, no, sorry, not train the model. Sorry, fine. I should be careful in the. Um, yes. Yeah. This is This is. Uh, this is. Yeah, supervised yeah, because uh, we, we are. Top of, uh, yeah. So this is basically. So we, yeah. And supervised in the sense, yes, we are basically saying, okay, this is the particular character. Like when we are giving it a frame, saying, okay, uh, this particular character, we are along with it, give the label also this particular character. So, so just a sort of backdrop that goes. To so it is fine tuning. Um, like uh, so fine tuning. So backdrop does it involve See, fine tuning of stable diffusion uh, does involve. Uh, yeah, actually, that's a very interesting topic. Probably you can actually talk about it later. Ask, uh, but the uh, thing is, is the difference between LoRa and DreamBoost is the same thing. Like in LoRa, uh, in DreamBoost, you basically fine tune the full model. LoRa basically you uh, just uh, add a new layers. You basically fine tune. So that's how it is uh, able to give you similar or equivalent result with less time. So, those things are coming. All right, guys, if you connect one on one, uh, like after this, we have like a chit chat network. So, you can connect one on one to the market and ask for this. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, if you're interested in workshop or if you're interested in generating a person, thank you. Great. Well, so um, last talk of the day today. And I have not had a lot of time to look into it, but I just want to understand here, uh, what, how would you rate your exposure to uh, like things like stable diffusion, generative AI? How many people would say they are beginners? Beginner here. Okay. How many people would say they are uh, experts? Nobody wants to be an expert. Nobody in the world is an expert at stable diffusion. And um, how many people say they are at an intermediate level? They have used it a little bit, generated some images. Okay, only the speakers. Okay, cool. Well, Bishop also. So what I want to share with you is uh, maybe just a little bit of intuition. I was trying to do like a whole talk and talk about a bunch of different models, but then everybody has covered it already. So what I want to share with you is just a little bit of the intuition about what has happened in the last three, four years that we are suddenly getting some of these really hyper realistic images, right? And what was not happening earlier. So uh, I want to cover that timeline. Basically, let's say starting from about 2018 to let's say 2023, what is happening? And I'll touch on just a few broad level areas and I'll try to cover all of this in 10, 12 minutes. So let's see how far we can get. So the back in 2018, 2019, the key way to generate images was using GANs. So how many people have heard the term GANs? All of us, right? And this is how GANs work, broadly speaking. So we have this, uh, we have this model over here, 
right? So the way the GAN, the way a GAN works is it has uh, you take some random input and you put this into a neural network called a generator, and you are expecting it to give you some kind of a nice image, maybe let's say a person's face. Now, obviously, a random uh, a, a trained model that's not already trained is going to you give it noise. It's going to give you noise output. It won't know how to generate a face. But then what you do is uh, alongside, you also keep some real images of faces and you take a real image and then you build a second model. The second model's job is to determine the difference between a real image of a face and a generated image of a face, right? So first you give this model a real, a few real images, and then you train it to say, uh, to uh, identify that, okay, this image is real. Okay. Now you generate a few images from this generator and you pass it into the same model and uh, train it to identify that these images were fake. So now what you have is you have a discriminator. So that's the first step you get like a discriminator. And what it's good at is if you give it a fake, if you give it a real image of a face, it's going to say like, it's going to identify that as real. If you give it a fake or let's say generated image of a face, and of course this generated image is coming from a generator. Excuse the bad handwriting. Um, and this is again coming from a noise input. So if you give the generator some noise and get a, a fake image and then put that into a discriminator, it's going to say, okay, you've given me a fake image, right? So now once you have this discriminator, so this discriminator is trained, let's say on maybe hundred images real and hundred generated images. Then what you do is you use that discriminator to then train the generator. Now what you do is you keep the discriminator fixed. And then you train the generator so that from noise, it is trying to fool the discriminator in a better and better fashion. In some sense, the discriminator becomes your loss function for the generator, right? So once the once the generator has learned a little bit how to better fool the discriminator, then you train the discriminator some more on the generator, slightly better images. Then you go back and train the generator. And so you do this back and forth, right? So you have this game that you've created that the discriminator's job is to detect differences between real and fake. The generator's job is to de detect the differences or uh, create better and better images that can fool the discriminator. And that leads to an output like this. Initially, the generator is outputting random noise, but over time it gets better and better in, let's say, creating these images. So these are example of handwritten digits from the MNIST database, but you extend this forward, you throw lots of compute, you put in lots of uh, images of faces. So this is from there is this website called this person does not exist.com. Every time you uh, open this um, website, it's going to call a GAN. It's going to generate a new face. And that has happened because this data set has been trained on the Celeb A data set, which contains millions of faces of data. And the GANs can get really good. Now, the trouble with GANs is that uh, the trouble with GANs is that you're trying to get your generator to go from some noise. So you are saying that I have noise. And from this noise, my generator, let's me just call it G has to give me a, like a large, high quality, high resolution image. Right. So there's a big jump that it has to make all in just one shot. Right. So you have to make bigger and bigger models. And this generator typically um, is like a convolutional neural network that takes on us. So you have to train bigger and bigger models. Right. Uh, the other is that uh, you need a lot of uh, control. You don't have a lot of control because anytime what can happen is the discriminator gets too, too good or the generator becomes too good, you lose control. You do not have fine tuned control over you want to make the person turn left, make the person turn right, and all of that. So here's the insight between uh, within diffusion models. So somebody came along, I, I don't recall exactly who, who said, why are we trying to go directly from some noise all the way to a very high quality image? How about we can, how about we progressively just create better and better images starting from noise? Okay, fine. We can try and create progressively better images, but the trouble is how do you train such a model? So the way to train such a model is to begin in the opposite direction. What you do is let's say we want to generate an image of a person. Right. So you start with a high quality, high resolution image of a person, and then you add some random Gaussian noise to it, which is basically just like increase the pixels up and down a little bit. Right. And then you go further and then you add some more random Gaussian noise to it. Right. So you're progressively taking a high quality image and adding random Gaussian noise to it till the point where you are ending, you end up with nothing but uh, a bunch of noise. Right. So it's the opposite thing. You take a high quality image and then you progressively add noise. Let me say this is T equal to zero or time step zero, time step one, all the way up to time step 
n whatever is your n right till the end and at time step n you all you have is just noise then now that we have this we can use this as a series of training sequences so now what you can do is you can train a model very this is a gross simplification but you can train a model to take this random noise and then generate a slightly better less random noised version so now this is much easier than going directly from the from here to here right so we have a much better much simpler model similarly you can then train the model also to generate this and you can train the model to generate this maybe sometimes you can train the model to generate two steps up uh, or generate bigger and bigger smaller and smaller things but now that gives you a lot more control and that is the key idea behind diffusion and once this was realized that we can do things incrementally um that suddenly led to this explosion of better and better models now of course that is just sort of the key idea here behind stable diffusion uh now what i'll point you to is if you want to learn more is check out this tutorial called the illustrated stable diffusion okay so now the illustrated stable diffusion what it tells you even if you don't read the text even if you don't understand any of the terms you can understand what are the components that go from this basic idea that i covered of adding noise to an image to actually building something that can take a prompt that can take an input image and in paint the image and so on right so this is basically what stable diffusion does you have a a prompt you give it into this huge model and the model gives you a high quality high resolution image uh, how do we get there well this is the other example you have a prompt and you have an image and you want to add a pirate ship here so then it is replaced with a pirate ship so how do we get there there are two parts there so there is this a prompt this prompt is first converted using a text understander into some kind of an encoding so you could use gpt or you could use any other encoder of the of the shell and then it is put into this image generator inside this image generator is where you have all of this logic of taking noise and converting that into some of this uh, converting that into this high quality image right so the text encoder gives you this output this intermediate representation that is fed into the image generator and now one general trend that you can see is that that's happened over the last 4 5 years is instead of having just this one model or one neural network that you train you are building you are using neural networks as components within a machine essentially it's like you're building out a car and you have like a, this engine you have like this axle you have like this steering so that's what each step is now getting replaced with a, a neural network right and i think that is one of the big realizations also in the last 4 5 years and you can train and then you can pre train and uh, put in all these images now the image generator itself consists of two parts the first part is the image information creator so the information creator basically what it does is given some noise given the prompt it can generate a intermediate representation that can that contains all the information to actually generate a high quality image and then you have this image decoder which is sort of a, a convolutional neural network that can blow up this uh, image information into this large high quality image right um so that's basically this is the uh, this is the structure you have this image information creator which is basically a unit if you know about what a unit is and it has that loop of like uh, incrementally taking some noise generating a better image generating a better image and so on right and uh, so that's what you can see that you have this token embeddings from the text and that is fed into the image information creator and that gives you this image information tensor right which is how do you take noise and convert that into the final uh, high quality image and then you have this auto encoder decoder which blows up that into this high quality image right and then you can go into each of these specific uh, each of these specific portions within the image information created this is where the actual diffusion is happening and uh, here's what happens right so if you uh, let, let me get to the information creator so here's what happens in the image information creator the opposite process that i looked at you start with some noise and then you put that into the image information creator which is a unit so this is what is called a unit often because it has like a it decreases so it has like an encoder component decoder component basically a uh, scales down the noise and it scales it up and it has of course the input from the text right so text prompt and it gives you a slightly better image then you put that again into the image information decoder it gives you a slightly better image and then you put that again into the uh, into the image generator and that gives you a better image but of course you don't have the actual image itself you just have like a uh, like an intermediate representation of that image right and what you do is you have to put that intermediate representation into this image decoder so initially when you have the random noise the image decoder converts that into a random noisy image 
but as you've gone through these multiple steps of passing the uh, noisy image through the image information creator, you get back this processed image information tensor that the image decoder is able to convert into this high quality image, right? So that's all it is taking some noise and slightly making it better and better. So there are two things that we've solved here. One is that you, you're not trying to go from noise to high quality image in one shot. And the second is that because you've bring, brought in this text prompt and how are these text prompts uh, generated, you might ask, well, there are lots of images on the internet and all of these images have these alt text caption. So when you're scraping the internet for images, you can also scrape their captions. And you, when you're training your image uh, uh, information creator, you can use those captions as an input and you can train the image information creator to work like that, right? Again, gross simplification. There are a lot of other like smaller hacks and details that are going on top of it. But basically that's what happens, right? At each step, you are progressively improving the uh, noise to, till by the step 50, you go from random noise to diffusion and you have the input from the text encoder that's helping you as well, right? So this is what that output looks like. Uh, the step-by-step -step output of the image information creator keeps making it better and better and better. And that's basically how stable diffusion works. And in a few years, the some of the underlying technologies, some of the underlying neural networks libraries are going to become so well developed that this level of understanding is probably going to be enough for us to like use maybe a high level library called diffusion AI or something where we can just code in these terms, right? What are the data we want to use? How many steps we want to use? What, what kind of image uh, encoder we want to use, which pre-trained uh, diffusion model we use. And you might not even require code to do this, right? So that's kind of what the future of this looks like. So yeah, that is, I hope that gives you like somewhat of an idea. That was that is as much as I understand right now. Honestly speaking, I've not had a time to dig very deep, but uh, that's how uh, I'm starting to look at diffusion. Okay. Cool. So that's the end of uh, our meetup, and I think this is a good good frame to end on. So after this, well, uh, we you can just hang around, talk to each other, chat. Uh, we also have some food and some beverages that you can have. And by the way, if you are looking to learn data science, machine learning, you know, we have a data science bootcamp, it's a completely online part-time program. Uh, we have some folks from our team here as well. We have Rishabh who's a bootcamp alumni. So you can check out uh, about our programs. All the brochures are on your tables. Or if you know somebody who, who else is uh, trying to learn some of these things, please feel free to share it with them. But thanks a lot for coming. And yeah, let's, let's just talk to each other. And thank you. <laughs>